So first of all, the first thing we have to discuss is what is a stock? A stock is a share in the ownership of a company. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people look at a stock and they see it as a stock ticker, a blip on the screen, or a three or four letter symbol. A stock is really a share in the ownership of a company. So when you invest in stock, you're investing in that company. You are a part owner of that company. Even if it's a very small part, you own a piece of that company. And as a result, this is holdings of a portion of the company's assets, as well as their liabilities. So this ownership stake is relative to the number of shares owned versus the shares outstanding. So if you have a lot of shares of that company, you are a larger owner. And if you have just a few shares of that company, you are a much smaller owner. So your ownership is relative to the number of shares you own versus the number of shares out there. But nonetheless, even if you own one share of a company, you own a small piece of that company. Now, a stock may offer rights to vote in company decisions depending on the share class. And we're going to discuss that in the next slide here. And that's something important too, guys. You have to understand that when you invest in a company, because you're an owner, you have to vote in company decisions. And I always encourage you guys to, you know, take advantage of those opportunities and you should vote in company decisions because you're part of the owner of that company. You, you know, you have just as much a say as anyone. Maybe you don't have as much of a vote because, you know, you don't own as many shares as some people, but you do have a say in those company decisions. And obviously the voting power corresponds with the ownership stake. So if you have many voting shares, you have a larger say. And if you have less shares, you have a smaller say in those company decisions. It is important to consider whether or not you have voting rights as a shareholder. And I always look for a company that allows me to vote in company decisions. So just for an example of a company that did not do this, we have Snapchat and they recently went public. So Snapchat offered class A shares, which do not include any voting rights or any votes. So if you're a Snapchat shareholder and you own class A shares, which are the ones that have been traded and that are on the uh, secondary market, you have no say in those company decisions. You have to rely solely on those who have voting shares. Uh, the Class B shares get one vote per share, and these were reserved for the early investors as well as the executives. And then the Class C shares are held solely by the co-founders, and they get 10 votes per share, uh, while the Class B voters got one vote per share. So just to put a picture on this, or just to explain this to you guys, the Snapchat co-founders hold 88.5% of the voting power while the public shareholders hold absolutely 0% voting power. So that's not something I like to see when I'm investing. That's why I'm always looking for a stock that offers me voting rights. Um, I know if you guys know Google, when they split shares, they offered uh, everybody who had an existing share one non-voting share per share they had. So that's why you have the GOOG and then the GOOGL. Um, one of them has voting rights, one of them does not have voting rights, so that's just another example there. But I always want to be buying shares of a stock that I have you know, voting rights because I want to have a say in company decisions. I don't want the co-founders or anybody to have 88.5% voting power. That means that pretty much whatever they say goes. And uh, I like to have more of a say in the companies that I'm part owner of. So what is the purpose? Why would a company go public? So companies offer shares to the public to raise capital through an initial public offering. So this is why a company will go out there and they will you know, offer shares to the public. Basically, companies can also raise money through borrowing or corporate bonds. And we're going to talk about bonds a lot um, in this course numerous times. But just to start off, a bond is a debt obligation. And bondholders receive interest in return for loaning the principal. A lot of people blur the lines between stocks and bonds, and we're really going to get into the difference of those two things because they are not the same thing at all. Um, but what is important to remember is that because a bond is a debt obligation, um, bondholders take priority over shareholders during a bankruptcy filing. So if worst case scenario, you're invested in a company that goes bankrupt, um, understand that anybody who is a bondholder, they're going to get paid before the shareholders do because you're part of an owner of the company where they're just a uh, debt obligation. So as a shareholder, you are last in line as far as the distribution of remaining assets goes. That's really nothing to be afraid of. I mean, if you're making sound investments, there's not a high risk of a company going bankrupt. I mean, if you're making high risk investments, yeah, there's a higher risk of a company going bankrupt. So just keep that in the back of your mind that shareholders are pretty much last in line as far as uh, distribution goes when they go bankrupt and they're finally sorting things out. 
So let's go ahead and cover the difference between bonds versus stocks. So bondholders do not see returns generated from rising profits. Uh, bondholders receive only a set interest rate, and that set interest rate typically does not change, so it's a predetermined figure. So many people like bonds because they have, in some cases, been a safer investment, um, but shareholders will see returns through the assets and appreciation as a result of rising profits. So if a corporation issues a bond and they use that money to you know, expand the business and as a result you know, they're seeing rising profits, the bondholders are not going to see any of that. They're just going to get that predetermined interest rate. While the shareholders, because they are a part owner of the company, uh, they're going to see part of those assets. You know, they're going to see that asset appreciation and they're going to be able to reap the benefits of those rising profits because they're part owner of that company. As a higher risk investment, stocks historically have paid a higher annualized return. So typically speaking, guys, uh, you know, stocks are a bit of a riskier investment. Again, like we said, as a stockholder, you're last in line to get paid during a bankruptcy filing. Um, and uh, so bonds being lower risk, they have paid a lower annualized return. However, um, I recommend to most people for a long-term portfolio, you should have a blend of bonds and stocks because, you know, it's best to be diversified. And there are certainly advantages to each one of these investment vehicles. So historically speaking, stocks have paid an annualized return ranging from 8 to 10%, and this is over the last 100 years. Now, bonds, on the other hand, have paid an annualized return ranging from 5 to 7%, so slightly less on the bonds, but like I said, it's best to have a mix of both of those in your portfolio. Now, with investing, the risk potential is relative to the reward potential, so when you have a higher risk associated with an investment, there is a higher potential return. Uh, but again, this is where some people get in trouble because they're looking for an unrealistic return from the market. And as a result, they take on too much risk or a risk that they're not comfortable with. And uh, that's a big place people get in trouble. So you definitely want to make sure you have a realistic figure or a realistic approach when it comes to investing and not be seeking an unrealistic return that's going to put you into a really high risk investment. Many successful investors have recommended a portfolio of blue chip stocks and investment grade bonds. Uh, namely would be Benjamin Graham. He talks about this a lot in The Intelligent Investor. And that is because, you know, the investment grade bonds have the lower risk potential. So you should have a mix of stocks and bonds. A well-rounded investment portfolio should include both stocks and bonds. And, uh, you know, the amount that you have in each really depends on your risk tolerance as well as the overall market conditions. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, going forward. So just an example of a portfolio. Actually, we're talking about it right now. So if you were in a market that was fairly valued, and we're going to talk about bull and bear markets in a little bit here, but basically if you're in a fair valued market where basically prices make sense and uh, you know companies are fairly valued, it would make sense to have 50% of your money in stocks and 50% of your money in bonds. Now, if we're in a bull market, and that's when many stocks and many companies become overvalued, and this is straight out of the intelligent investor, guys. Uh, Benjamin Graham says, you know, he recommends that you could go into 25% stocks and 75% bonds because during a bear market, uh, bonds tend to be more durable investments. And when stocks become overvalued, you'd want to have less of those in your portfolio and be more heavily invested in bonds. Now, the opposite is true during a bear market because during a bear market, stocks become significantly undervalued. So at that point, it might make sense to have 75% of your money in stocks and 25% of your money in bonds. So this is called, you know, reallocation or, you know, allocating a portfolio or rebalancing. Basically, allocating more or less money into portfolio assets is known as rebalancing. And then stocks become overvalued in a bull market and should carry less weight in your portfolio. As we said, during a bull market, stocks become overvalued. You know, they are uh, trading at price levels that really don't make sense. And then in a bear market, you know, stocks become undervalued and should carry more weight in your portfolio because you want to take advantage of the rally when, you know, markets do correct. Many investors pay a fee to financial advisors, and one of the perks they offer is rebalancing. So rebalancing is very important. You can do it yourself, but um, a lot of people would rather have a financial advisor do this for them. But I'm guessing if you're somebody who is watching this course and you're involved on this level, you want to be in control of your own portfolio, and you wouldn't mind rebalancing yourself. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the initial public offering. So as I'm sure you know, or maybe you don't know, there are public companies out there and there are private companies. 
And uh, any company that wants to trade their shares on a secondary exchange to the public has to go through the process known as an initial public offering. Uh, this is when a company is looking to raise capital through the public offering of shares of that company. And at that point, an underwriter works with the company to set the IPO price based on the perceived interest. So if this is a hot company and uh, you know they're doing really big things and they expect a lot of interest in that stock, you may see a higher IPO price. Uh, and if it's maybe not such an interesting company, they may have a lower IPO price. But this is something the underwriter helps them determine uh, the IPO price. Now what happens is the institutional investors, which are the large investors with millions of dollars to invest, they are given the opportunity to purchase shares at the IPO price. Now you as a small time investor, you are likely never going to see that stock at the IPO price because by the time it trades on the secondary market, uh, the market has already set the price for that stock and it's going to be much higher typically than that IPO price. So after the large investors are given the opportunity, the stock trades on the secondary market. And depending on the level of interest, the stock may trade significantly higher on the secondary market. And obviously in the last couple of years in this bull market we've been seeing, many stocks that have gone public trade significantly higher on the secondary market than that initial public offering price. So as a small investor, it is difficult, if not impossible, to get in on the initial offering. IPOs are also a high-risk territory, and I don't recommend you guys invest in an IPO. So here's the biggest problem I see with IPOs. People think it's great because it's a new stock they can invest in. They want to get in on the, on the uh, ground floor, and they say, okay, you know, a stock is going public. I want to, you know, buy up some shares. Look at what happened with Snapchat, guys. Um, the only reason you should invest in the company is if you really like that company and you want to be a part owner of it. You don't want to invest in the company solely because of the fact that they are going public. Drastic price fluctuations are usually seen as the market sets the price for the stock. So it's a very volatile time for this stock. It's high risk territory. And as we've seen with many IPOs recently, I mean, look at the Blue Apron IPO, the Snapchat IPO. If you go back and look at the Twitter IPO, look at the GoPro IPO, all of these stocks fell significantly um, after their public offering. So all that hype kind of died off and then, you know, they were set at an accurate market price, which was much lower than that stock was trading at. So most investors should avoid investing in a stock for a few months after the initial public offering. If you're looking to make a long-term investment, guys, wait for the market to set the price. And odds are, most times you will see a stock price come down after that initial public offering. It even happened with Facebook. I know they, they really took off after their IPO, but if you look at the stock price, which I believe I have that coming up here, um, during the initial public offering, they did come down off of the uh, what they first traded out on the secondary market. So unless you can get in early, unless you're an institutional investor, or for whatever reason you're able to get in on the first round at the IPO price, you want to wait for the price to settle and for the excitement of that initial public offering to drop off. So first example here is Facebook. So this is a stock that had a fantastic IPO. Um, as you can see, they started trading on the secondary market around the uh, $40 range. I'm not sure what that price was. But even that stock in the first couple of months there, as you can see, it fell from that IPO price. But obviously now, a couple of years later, the stock is at $171 a share. And this was as of August 7th. So uh, I'm not sure what that stock price is at now. But obviously, since their IPO at a $38 initial public offering, uh, this has been a wonderful IPO. And uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are trying to buy the next Facebook and uh, that's why a lot of people invested in Twitter and Snapchat because they're hoping for it to do what this Facebook IPO did. So now let's look at an IPO that didn't do so well. Here's the Twitter IPO. So Twitter went public at $26 a share. Um, when it hit the secondary market it was well over 40 a share so there was a lot of excitement surrounding that stock. Um, it broke $60 a share. I believe they came just close to 70 a share at their peak and then they went into a you know a downtrend here as the excitement tapered off and here they were on August 7th at 16.38 a share that's way down from that IPO price and much further down from that uh, you know $70 share price back in 2014 when it peaked on the secondary market. So this just goes to show you guys how an initial public offering can be high risk territory. You certainly see more cases like Twitter than you do see cases like Facebook. So I just want you guys to understand that you know, not every IPO is going to be like Facebook's IPO.
Okay, so now we're going to talk about what a stock symbol is. This is basically what you're going to type in when you're looking up a stock on Yahoo Finance or on your Robinhood app or whatever it is that you're using. So a stock symbol is a unique series of letters assigned to a security for identification purposes, and a stock symbol is used to execute trading orders. So stock symbols are often referred to as the ticker symbol, and the New York Stock Exchange listed stocks have three letters or less while the NASDAQ listed stocks have four or more letters. And we're going to talk about those stock exchanges in a little bit. But just understand that a stock symbol is something you use to identify your stock. If you have a stock broker that's an in-person broker, you're going to call him up on the phone and you're going to use your stock symbol to tell him what stock you're actually talking about. It's just identification purposes for that stock. So, uh, you know, they can know what stock you're talking about and identify it on the exchange. So let's use an example here with the Coca-Cola company. They trade on the New York Stock Exchange, and their stock symbol is KO. Another stock people know is Amazon. They trade on the NASDAQ Exchange, and that's a four-letter symbol, A-M-Z-N. Now, here's something interesting. Uh, this is something I was just doing out of habit. I didn't know the reason for this, but I guess I had seen it done before. A lot of times I would put a dollar sign before my stock symbol when I was writing it down. That's actually called the cash tag, and I believe that is used on Twitter to associate that tag with a stock. So it's just a way to identify that as a stock symbol um, on some social media platforms. But that's just called the cash tag. So if you ever see a dollar sign in front of the stock symbol, that's why that is. Um, so there's Coca-Cola's logo there. Obviously, everybody's familiar with Coca-Cola. If you wanted to go out there and buy Coca-Cola stock, you would call up your stock broker or you'd go on your trading app and you would type in the symbol KO to get to the Coca-Cola stock. Okay, so now let's talk about a stock exchange. So a stock exchange is the marketplace where securities are bought and sold. And stock exchanges connect a buyer with a seller. So oftentimes a stock is referred to as a listed stock and in my opinion, guys, I mean, you guys can do whatever you want. I'm giving you my best advice from the years that I've, you know, researched this stuff and been investing myself. But you should only invest in listed stocks. And we're going to go over a lot of reasons why this is. But a listed stock is a stock trading on a major exchange. And this is typically the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ Exchange. So other exchanges like the OTCBB, which is the over-the-counter bulletin board, and Pink Sheets exist as well. Those of you who are familiar with the Wolf of Wall Street movie, I'm sure you know what happened with uh, people buying stocks off of pink sheets. Uh, they were brokers making ridiculous commissions off them, and it was really a bad area, things that were being pawned off on investors. You still see a lot of people, you know, looking for deals on the over-the-counter bulletin board and on the pink sheets, and uh, this is a type of speculation. We're going to talk about speculation versus investing later on here, but I would stay on the listed exchanges, especially as a beginner. Now, foreign countries have their own stock exchange. For example, there's TSX, which is the Toronto Stock Exchange. So the largest stock exchange is the New York Stock Exchange. And the New York Stock Exchange is an auction-based marketplace. So specialists are actually out there on the trading floor. These are actual people. And they represent a particular stock, and then they fill orders in an auction-style format. So many argue that electronic exchanges are more efficient and reduce the spread. And the spread, we're going to talk about that later, but basically that's the difference between the bid price and the ask price, or what someone is selling a stock for and what someone is willing to buy for. So they feel that having specialists involved results in a larger spread and electronic exchanges have, a, uh, low, have less of a spread. Uh, now major exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange have listing requirements, and this is the number one reason why I recommend you only trade listed stocks. So New York Stock Exchange companies must have a share price above $4 a share and a market capitalization above $40 million. So now on to the NASDAQ Exchange. So the NASDAQ is an electronic exchange. NASDAQ stands for the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotations, but everybody just refers to this as the NASDAQ. Um, the NASDAQ exchange has listing requirements as well. Uh, the biggest difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ exchange is the New York Stock Exchange has a specialist representing the stock, while the NASDAQ, all of that is handled electronically, all of the orders. So basically for the NASDAQ exchange, um, the stock has to be over $4 a share. If it falls below $4 a share, they risk being delisted and knocked off onto the uh, over-the-counter bulletin board or the pink sheets. And as we said, a delisted stock will end up trading on an over-the-counter stock exchange, which is not a desirable place to be. Okay, so let's talk about these over-the-counter exchanges. 
So over-the-counter exchanges often list smaller companies or those who fail to meet the minimum listing requirements of a major exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. So major exchanges have high liquidity, which is not a characteristic of the over-the-counter markets. So what I mean by liquidity is um, when there is high liquidity with a market, there will likely always be a buyer when you're looking to sell, and there will likely always be a seller when you are looking to buy, because this is a very actively traded stock. Because most people are trading on the major exchanges, um, it has much better liquidity. Uh, you do not see good liquidity on these over-the-counter exchanges, and that is a big problem that you can run into. So many people are interested in penny stocks, and I'm hoping to deter you from being interested in them with this course here, because um, they are not glamorous. They are not what they are painted out to be, and unfortunately, there are a lot of very shady characters out there that are recommending people invest in penny stocks, and... Um, Really, I don't think penny stocks have any business being in your um, stock portfolio. Uh, but we're going to get into that a little bit later when we talk about investment vehicles. But new investors should stick to the listed stocks on the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. Avoid these over-the-counter stock exchanges. Um, really, they're nothing for beginners to get involved with. Okay, so the first over-the-counter exchange is the OTCBB, or the over-the-counter bulletin board. Now, the OTCBB does not have a minimum listing requirement, and as a result, they often carry less desirable companies. Um, that's a very nice way of saying they carry the dog shit, okay? Um, these are companies that uh, most investors would not be interested in for a number of reasons. Uh, you have to think there's got to be reasons why they're not able to remain listed on a major stock exchange. So stocks trading off major exchanges often have poor liquidity. So as a result, uh, you may not have a buyer on the other end when you are ready to sell. And there may not be a seller when you are ready to buy. So imagine if you're in a situation like that where, let's say you do decide to buy a penny stock. You do decide to invest in a penny stock. And uh, you pick up 20,000 shares and all of a sudden, you know, the share price is up and you go, oh, fantastic. Time to sell my position. And you go on your trading app and you execute the order and it just sits there. And it sits there because nobody is ready to buy. There's poor liquidity on the over-the-counter bulletin board and over-the-counter markets. And as a result, even though you want to sell, you may not be able to. So that's typically not going to be a problem on a major exchange. So that's one of the biggest reasons I say stay off of the over-the-counter bulletin board and these over-the-counter markets. Okay, next we have the pink sheets. This is another type of over-the-counter trading. There is no minimum listing requirement with pink sheets, and the companies are not required to file with the SEC. That should be a big red flag to you. Obviously, companies on the major exchanges are required to file quarterly with the Securities and Exchange Commission, but on the pink sheets, they are not required to file. OTC bulletin board companies, uh, they are also required to file with the SEC, so the pink sheets are the worst of the worst. This is even worse than the over-the-counter bulletin board stocks because these companies don't even have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Over-the-counter stocks typically trade for a few cents a share, giving them the name penny stocks. However, if you look at the um, SEC-defined definition, um, they call a penny stock any stock trading under $5 a share. I guess it depends on what you see as a penny stock. I tend to talk about penny stocks as stocks that are, you know, 99 cents or below, you know, something along those lines. But you'll often see stocks trading for a fraction of a penny on some of these over-the-counter exchanges. So the biggest things that you need to know about over-the-counter stocks is that they are high risk and they are very volatile stocks. Uh, so volatile means they are very erratic. There's a lot of explosive price movements, multiple percentage price swings, even on a day-to-day -day basis. And another huge problem with this is that these stock prices can be manipulated. Um, so let me give you an example of this. The most common one is called the pump and dump scheme. So this is when somebody will buy a bunch of shares of some random penny stock. And typically this is somebody who has a following or an influence out there. So they pick up a bunch of shares of some random penny stock and then they put together some articles celebrating this stock and saying this is the next hot penny stock, you got to get your hands on this. And they get people to buy the stock because they're telling everyone this is the next hot stock. So because the liquidity is so low, as a result, um, the prices can be moved with um, not very many orders. So in order to move a stock price, in order to see a stock price rise in full, there has to be a lot of orders. But with a penny stock, because they are trading at a much lower volume, and we're going to talk about volume later, um, the stock price can be manipulated very easily. 
So what happens is this person buys a bunch of shares of this company. They go and they tell everyone they need to buy it. And as a result, everyone buys the stock and the stock price soars. The person who originally bought all those shares now sells their entire position and they walk away. And obviously after that, the stock price falls. And that is called a pump and dump scheme. Now, for those of you who are wondering about people like Tim Sykes, I know I have a lot of people ask me about his strategy. He essentially short sells the pump and dump schemes. And we're going to talk about short selling uh, later on in the course here, but what he does is he looks for signs that somebody's manipulating a stock price and he short sells that. So understand that most people who are making money, and there are very few people who are making consistent profits day trading, but most people who are making money day trading are short selling what appears to be a manipulated stock price. They're not doing a traditional buy low, sell high investment, so they're doing a short sale. Uh, so I just want you guys to understand that that is the kind of fishy stuff you'll see going on. Uh, through the over-the-counter trading. Alright, so now we're going to define what a bull market is. So if you're still watching this course in 2017, a bull market is what we have been seeing for the last couple of years. In a bull market, share prices are rising and most investors are buying. Uh, now, bullish investors make money from rising stock prices and the reason it's called a bullish investor or a bull market is because when a bull attacks, they attack um, in an upward motion with their horns and that's just to symbolize rising stock prices so when you're a bull um, you're investing in a stock when you expect the price to rise and you make money from rising stock prices a bull market occurs during a strong economic time and uh, company profits will be rising unemployment will be falling and wages will be rising as well these are all telltale signs of a bull market now GDP or gross domestic product is also growing and this is an indicator of the overall size of an economy looking at goods and services. So this is something that people look at um, when they're trying to tell whether or not we are in a bear market or a bull market and over the last couple of years we have seen a bull market. Now the important thing you guys have to remember and we're going to talk about this a lot so don't worry about this now, but the biggest problem out there is that people are so petrified of this bear market, and uh, it makes sense because you know a lot of a lot of Wall Street news um, outlets push this and they push the fear on people. But there's absolutely no reason to ever fear a bear market. It's a temporary you know correction that takes place, and uh, we're going to talk about the psychology of the stock market later on in this course. So don't worry about that just yet. But um, I just don't want you guys to worry about a bear market. It's a very regular occurrence. But just for example's sake, here are three bull markets that I've highlighted here. And obviously we are currently in that bull market that started around the end of 2009 into 2010. And uh, as you can see, this has been quite the bull ride here. We are uh, over seven years in on this bull market. Um, the other two bull markets are highlighted there as well. And um, then we're going to talk about a bear market now. So in a bear market, share prices are falling and most investors are selling or they are out of the market. Now bearish investors make money from falling stock prices and this is similar to how a bear attacks. They attack with their claw in a downward motion so that is symbolic of bearish investors who are hoping a stock price will go down in value um, and they make money from falling stock prices. And a bear market happens during poor economic times. Company profits will be falling, unemployment will be rising, wages will be flat or falling and that GDP is also falling. The primary triggers of a bear market are investor sentiment and economic cycles and we're going to explain what those are in a little bit here um, but the economic cycles part is just you know part of a cycle it's kind of like how we have it's just like the seasons you know we have different seasons in our climate and you know we're gonna have different seasons in the stock market so it's really just economic cycles there are things that happen um, that really we have no control over now federal interest rates and tax rates can result in economic expansions or contractions basically when you see lower interest rates um, that is um, cheaper corporate borrowing so you may see companies borrowing more money and expanding because of the lower interest rates and obviously tax rates um, eat into profits so if you see taxes lowering you're going to see more profits for a company and if taxes are rising there's going to be less profits and at the end of the day that is going to be passed on to the shareholder um, through the earnings per share and eventually you know it's going to be represented in that share price so here I've highlighted the two recent bear markets and as you can see the bear markets are typically a much shorter duration than those bull markets um, so those are just two of the most recent bear markets we have seen 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about investor sentiment, which is one of the biggest precursors to a bear or a bull market. So investor or market sentiment is the overall feeling of the market. And as we will discuss later on, the market is controlled by the emotions of fear and greed. I know a lot of people try to overcomplicate the stock market. They try to make it all about numbers and figures. And uh, the truth is, guys, the stock market is controlled by two things. That is the fear and the greed. And I want you guys to commit that to memory. Um, these go hand in hand with supply and demand, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But uh, the majority of the market is simply controlled by fear and greed. Now, falling investor confidence or fear indicated by a sell-off, that will indicate a bear market may be on the horizon. So when investors lose confidence in the market, they become fearful. A lot of them begin to sell off, and um, that sell-off can really push us into a bear market. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that a lot of people do things because they are afraid of a bear market. So something happens, maybe there's something going on in the geopolitical climate, maybe there's something going on that they're worried about. For example, a lot of people had concerns when Donald Trump was elected president. And uh, so as a result, if people are fearful enough and there is enough sell-off pressure, um, this sell-off in fear of a bear market can actually trigger that bear market and turn those expectations into a reality. So oftentimes, people being afraid of a bear market and taking actions, uh, that actually causes the bear market itself, which is very interesting. So there are actually a couple different stages of the bear market. So here are the four stages of a bear market. So number one, we are at a period where prices are high. There's bullish sentiments, so people are expecting stock prices to go higher. We're in a bull market, and many investors begin to take profits. So this is a point where... A lot of beginner investors are getting in because that's the point when uh, you're starting to realize that um, markets are a little bit high, the prices are a little high. And when stupid money is being made, when you see beginners getting into the stock market and making money, um, that's not to say you guys won't have luck with it. I mean, you guys are taking the steps to educate yourself and this separates you from what I call a beginner. I call a beginner the type of person who just dives right in without uh, you know, solidifying an educational foundation. But, you know, you see a lot of people that are diving in and they're making money, you know, on their first couple of investments and trades and you're kind of going, wow, that's, that's kind of weird. You know, usually people are, you know, some people are having luck with it, some people are not. But when everyone is having luck with it, that's a sign that, you know, the bull market may be a little overextended. And this is when the institutional investors and the, uh, you know, the hardened investors who have lived through a bear market, they've already lived through this. A lot of these new investors have never even seen or heard of a bear market, um, a lot of those older investors who have some more experience, that's when they start to take profits. They get a little skeptical of the market. They say, you know, things seem a little bit overvalued. We're seeing a lot of people just diving right in and making money um, right off the bat. And that's not typical of a market. So that's when they say, okay, we're going to start to take profits off the table. So as a result of that profit taking, prices begin to fall. And that's when the herd follows, okay? Um, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but I just want to bring it up now. You have the bulls out there. The bulls make money from rising stock prices. The bears make money from falling stock prices, and the sheep or the hogs get slaughtered. I use the sheep as the terminology. Some people use hogs, but I always use it as the sheep because I think of the sheep being following the herd. And so think of the sheep out there as the herd in the masses, and the sheep are going to follow the herd. And as a result, when people begin to take profits, everyone's going to start to sell because the herd is going to follow. So basically, the initial investors took profits, and now the herd is going to follow because they're looking to take profits because loss aversion is being triggered. This is one of the psychological reasons why people sell a stock. We're going to get into this later on. That's going to be one of my favorite sections to cover. Um, so at this point, panic begins to be triggered, and the market is very uncertain. You're seeing a very volatile market. People have concerns about the market. And in investor sentiment at that point is moving from a, uh, a bullish sentiment towards a bearish sentiment. Right now, it's pretty much uncertain. So if this does end up resulting in a bear market, you're going to see prices fall and fall and fall. Um, people are going to be more fearful of the market. More people are going to be getting out of the market. But once the market is oversold, buying will eventually outpace the selling, and this is going to create demand. So at that point, you're going to see a little bit of greed. You're going to see greed start to step in. So for a while there during the, you know, the second stage, investors are very fearful. Everyone's getting out of the market. People are saying you'd be crazy to buy. Um, but once you get to step three there or stage three, that's when you're seeing investors start to say, okay, 
Um, there's a lot of good companies that are significantly undervalued. I'm going to start investing. And oftentimes it's those who took profits before the bear market. It's those institutional investors, those long-time investors that have been through many bear markets and bull markets. They start to understand that, hey, these are just cycles. These are just trends. And that's when they start to scoop up these undervalued stocks and they begin to support the stock prices. And then eventually the fall levels off and investors enter the market again. And at that point, the market gives way to a bull market. This is finally the end of that bear market. Prices are being supported, and then you're starting to see prices rise. So now let's talk about these stages of a bull market. And this one's a little bit longer. There's six different stages to a bull market I want to discuss. Uh, but first, let's have a quote from Sir John Templeton. Bull markets are born on pessimism, grown on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. Uh, this is one of the best ways you could ever understand what a bull market is. And uh, I highly recommend you guys write this quote down somewhere. You can pause this video, write it in the notes on your phone. Just go back to this to remind yourself what a bull market is. Because most people don't understand that a bull market will die. And uh, you know that's why people have that mindset thinking that prices will only go up. The first thing that happens is that bear market comes to an end and bullish investors begin to support the stock price. So the first step is that prices bottom out and this can be an abrupt V-shaped bottom out or a gradual rolling low. So it can be a very sharp turnaround or it can be a turnaround that takes um, a little bit of time. Um, next what happens is speculative investors start to buy but the market sentiment is skepticism. Many see this as a rally in the ongoing trend of the bear market. So a lot of times you'll hear people saying, this is your last time to get out of the market. You know, we're seeing a short rally here. We're seeing a short-lived rally. That's not sustainable. So if you were looking to get out of the market, you know, this is the time to do it. That's what you're going to hear people saying. But this is the point when these speculative investors begin to scoop up stocks. They're usually the first ones in. Um, you know, kind of picture it as a, as a place that was hit by a hurricane. And uh, these are the first people that go in there to start to rebuild. You know, a lot of people say they're crazy. The area has been destroyed. And uh, these are the first people on the ground. The first boots on the ground are these speculative investors. Now, eventually, the overall economy strengthens and earnings begin to grow. And this is when the value investors start to hunt for dividends and undervalued companies. So this is when there are definite signs that the bear market is coming to a close. We're seeing definite signs of a bull market underway and as a result value investors we're going to talk about value investors later this is a strategy that Benjamin Graham teaches and uh, it's pretty much the strategy of Warren Buffett as well but this is when the value investors are going to start hunting for dividends and undervalued companies so they're going to be the next ones who are going into that destroyed area you know the hurricane was hit the first people went in there and now more people are like okay it looks like the damage is done people are starting to rebuild I think I'm going to move into that area too and start to rebuild as well now, the fourth stage of the bull market is when the rising tides lift all boats. This is a very important thing I want you guys to remember with the stock market is the rising tides lift all boats. Retail investors enter the market and experience beginner's luck. Um, this is when things start to get a little overvalued again. So we were talking about this earlier. This is when retail beginner investors, first-time investors, dive into the market. And again, I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about people who have no educational foundation. They pick stocks based on whatever stock is being mentioned in the news, and they start to experience beginner's luck. Um, the investors are blindly optimistic solely because they have no experience in the market, and they've never lived through a bear market. So they really only see what is ahead of them and what has happened over the last year or so. They don't understand that a bear market is uh, looming on the horizon at some point. So this is when you're going to see stocks soar above IPO prices. So we talked about IPOs earlier. And uh, when a company is going public and you see them soar well above that initial public offering price, that's often a sign that um, we are in a bit of an overly optimistic market at that point. The fifth stage of a bull market is when investors are outright delusional. And this is when stocks become significantly overvalued and keen investors get a whiff and some take profits off the table. So this is when the larger institutional investors, again, they start to get skeptical. They're seeing people making money hand over fist. They're seeing beginners get into the market and see unrealistic returns. They're going, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem like a healthy market. So this is when a lot of investors begin to take money off the table. And then obviously this is where the sixth stage is triggered. This is when stock prices level off and begin to fall. Retail investors are hoping to break even on investments and the bullish sentiment 
waivers. So what I mean by this is a lot of these beginner uh, retail investors buy a stock at the peak and then they're starting to see prices waver and they're just looking to break even. They just want to get out of the market. You're seeing people who are generally uncertain and uh, the overall market sentiment is moving from bullish to a skeptical stage. And that's when the bull market will eventually give way to a bear market. So guys, those are all of the stages of a bull and bear market and how they tie in together. Okay, so now I want to talk about what is true about the stock market and what is smoke and mirrors. Because unfortunately, like I said, there's a lot of people out there that are misleading you guys. They're misleading you about the stock market. They're trying to push you to get unrealistic returns. And I want to really set the record straight and tell you guys the truth about the stock market. And this is just from what I've realized through my own experience and just my years of reading and doing research and really looking for qualified opinions out there and not so much the loudest in your face person or whoever showing up on my uh, Facebook ads. But most beginners expect an unrealistic return from the stock market. This is the cold hard truth. I know when I first started investing a couple years ago, I was like, oh, I want to find, you know, a 20, 30, maybe 40% return. I had no idea what I was talking about. I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I thought that you needed a 40%, 30%, 20% return to get rich. And you really don't. Um, so when I first got started, that's what I had in mind. I was like, well, you know, I obviously have to look for you know, quite the return, maybe a 30, 40% return. The other thing is that many people make the mistake of speculating, which is betting on penny stocks or looking for a 100% return in the short term. So beginners get into the market, they have unrealistic expectations. And as we said, you know, risk corresponds with reward. They want to look for a high potential reward investment. So they go after the riskiest investment they can, which oftentimes is penny stocks or a speculative investment. We're going to talk about speculating versus investing later on. Um, this is one of the most important things you guys need to understand. Um, the other thing that's true, and this is something you're going to hear from a lot of people, they're going to say, the stock market stole money from me. Uh, you know, the market never took a penny from anyone. You gave it to them. Nobody held a gun to your head and told you to buy or sell a stock. You made those decisions yourself, and you have to own up to those decisions. If you made shitty decisions, hey, you know what, it is what it is. But, you know, at least admit that it was you who made those decisions. Don't be somebody who's saying the market stole money from you or, you know, anything along those lines. But you're going to come across a lot of people who say things like that. If you look at a quote from Warren Buffett here, this is very true about the stock market. Um, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. So you want to be a patient investor. And the impatient investors are going to be paying the patient ones. Um, the stock market is a tool for building wealth over time. It is not a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not something you should get into with the hopes of becoming an overnight millionaire. If you're looking for that, you should probably go start your own business or do something else. It's not going to be the stock market, for most people anyway. Stocks are a tool for building wealth over time. Investing is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And unfortunately, many people, especially beginners, treat it like a sprint. Uh, they want to hit the ground running. They want to find explosive returns. They want to take risks. And uh, it's just not going to work out well for you based on statistics. Short-term investing is speculating largely relying on luck. And luck is a strategy I never like to rely on. Luck is not something that is repeatable. And when you're investing, you're looking for a strategy that is scalable and repeatable. And, and uh, luck is not something that you can repeat with any kind of consistency. The other truth about the stock market is that most investors buy and sell at exactly the wrong time. So what I mean by this is most investors are in the herd. Most investors are the sheep and they're going to follow the market. So as a result, they're going to buy high and sell low. And that's exactly the wrong strategy. And this is known as following the market. This is what most people do. And this is why most people lose money in the stock market. They're doing what the market does or following the herd. So now let's talk about the smoke and mirrors. This is what a lot of people try to tell you about the stock market, and uh, it's just not true. First of all, the stock market is not a get-rich-quick scheme. A investment in the stock market or investment in stocks is a way to build long-term wealth over time, and as we said, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Luck is not scalable and repeatable, so that is why I do not recommend making speculative investments based off of luck. Um, you might get lucky once. Uh, what are the odds of that happening 10 times in a row? The stock market is not a losing game. So many people out there say this. I swear to God, every time I go talk to people about the stock market, or they see me reading a book. I mean, the, earlier this summer, I was on vacation reading The Intelligent Investor. Someone came up to me. They're like, hey, what are you reading? I said, oh, The Intelligent Investor. He goes, oh, stocks are a losing game. And it's like, they are not a losing game. 
Uh, again, like we said, the stock market never took a penny from anyone, so do not look at the stock market as a losing game. The other important thing to know here is that nobody can time the market with any sustainable accuracy. So especially right now, uh, we're seeing a lot of people in the news talking about the upcoming bear market or the market correction. And um, if you look into the history of these people, a lot of them have made these doomsday prophecies every single year prior so you know if I told you that we were going to see a market correction in 2012 2013 14 15 16 17 and in 2018 it happens am I accurate because I guessed wrong you know the seven or eight times before then so this is what you tend to see with these you know doomsday people out there who believe that they can time the market they often have made dozens of wrong guesses in the past and maybe they're right once um, you know so I wouldn't follow anybody who tells you that they can accurately or sustainably you know time the market the other thing is that you do not need a sophisticated trading platform to be successful in the stock market uh, this all depends on what you're doing if you are somebody who decides you're gonna go be a day trader this is not something I do and uh, hopefully this isn't somebody who's watching this course expecting how to learn how to day trade we're gonna talk about day trading we're gonna talk about short-term trading just so you guys can get exposed to it but this is not a course on how to day trade um, it's not something I do it's not something I recommend and here's the main reason why 90% of day traders lose money and about 1% are predictably profitable. So in order to be a successful day trader, you need to be in that 1% of people who are predictably profitable. And uh, that's that's pretty, pretty bad odds against you. You're going to have 99 people who are going to be unsuccessful and that one person is the person who's going to be predictably profitable. Uh, so if you are day trading, yes, they do use sophisticated trading platforms. But don't ever let anyone or any trading platform or company sell you on some couple hundred dollar trading platform. You most likely don't need it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about market capitalization. So this is basically the value of a company based on share price. Market cap is equal to the outstanding shares, which is the total number of shares out there owned by both insider investors as well as public investors times the price per share. And as we said, their outstanding shares is the stock held by all shareholders, both public and private. Market cap is used to determine the overall size of a company based on market value. And stocks are broken up into five categories based on market capitalization. Now understand there are no set list of standards. Um, this is basically based on my own thoughts as well as research I've done. So if you go out there and look up a small cap stock, they may find that somebody else may say it's a different price range. So understand there's no set rules out there. A lot of this is just um, my own thoughts on this as well as research I've done myself. But first of all, we have micro cap stocks. These are stocks with a market capitalization of under $300 million. And one example of a company that is falling under a micro cap stock is a biotech company called Chimerics. A small cap stock has a market capitalization of $300 million to $3 billion. An example of this is the craft supplier named Etsy. A mid cap stock is worth uh, $3 billion to $15 billion in terms of market cap. An example of this is AMD Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, large cap would be 15 billion to 100 billion. An example of this is the company known as Applied Materials. And then we have Mega Cap. These are the big companies worth over 100 billion dollars in terms of market cap. And one example of this is Alphabet, formerly known as Google. And just understand there are no set rules on what is considered a micro, small, mid, large cap, etc. This is just based on my own research and thoughts on this. Uh, not really a huge deal. I mean, if you go up to someone and they say, no, I think a mid-cap stock is $2 billion to $15 billion, not $3 billion, no big deal. Uh, just understand that it's within those ranges somewhere where you're going to classify what these stocks are. Um, and it's important you understand when you're investing in a stock what the market capitalization is because um, there are certain characteristics of stocks based on market capitalization. So here we go. Here are those characteristics we were just talking about. So micro cap stocks, those are the smallest ones on my list there. These are the smallest and riskiest stocks available on the market. Oftentimes you're going to find micro cap stocks trading on the over the counter exchanges. Then we have small cap stocks. These are the ones that have huge growth potential, but they still are a riskier investment. Mid cap stocks have a blend of the safety of the large cap stocks and the growth potential of small cap stocks. That is why mid-cap stocks are some of my favorite stocks to invest in. 
Large cap stocks are lower risk stocks for those looking for appreciation and dividends. So large and mega cap stocks are stocks that pay dividends. We're going to talk about dividends a little bit later if you aren't familiar with those. And then the mega cap stocks are the titans of the industry. These are the top three usually of whatever industry they are in. And they tend to be very low risk and durable investments mostly because they are so large and they've, uh, you know, they're time tested durable companies. Most investors should avoid micro cap stocks and be cautious with small cap stocks, understanding the risk involved with them. All right, so now we're gonna look at the price to earnings ratio. So the price to earnings ratio or the PE ratio measures the current market price per share relative to the earnings per share. Uh, basically, it's equal to the market value divided by earnings per share. Um, the best way to look at price to earnings ratio is how much you will pay for $1 of company earnings. The P.E. ratio is used to compare stocks within the same sector and a high P.E. can indicate the stock is overvalued while a low P.E. can indicate that the stock is undervalued. That is one of the biggest things I want you guys to understand about the P.E. ratio is you should be using it to compare stocks within the same sector or the same industry. So you wouldn't take the P.E. of a biotech stock and compare it to the P.E. of a beverage company. You would need to compare a beverage company to another beverage company or a biotech stock to another biotech stock. You don't use it to compare um, the PE of two companies of different sectors but you can compare it to the sector average or the industry average PE to get an idea of whether or not that stock is overvalued or undervalued compared to that uh, sector or industry now remember that a company that is not generating earnings has no PE ratio or a negative PE and I do not recommend investing in companies that are not generating earnings um, that's just my personal advice, um, so that's something you want to look out for, and that's a good telltale indicator of whether or not a company is generating profits and earnings is looking at that P.E. ratio. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. So we're looking at Apple. Um, as of making this, this was on August 10th of 2017 when I did this slide here, but so Apple had a P.E. ratio of 17.66. And we grabbed a couple of their competitors here just to compare them. So Hewlett Packard has a PE ratio of 13.31. IBM has a PE ratio of 11.79. And Samsung has a PE ratio of 13.1. So investing $17.66 in Apple stock will expose you to $1 of Apple's earnings. And again, this is as of August 10th. But we could just use the P.E. ratio of Apple to compare it to a couple of other companies in the same industry. So obviously Apple is a little bit more expensive than Hewlett Packard and IBM. But I would argue that they have a lot more upside potential and they have a lot more going on than these older companies that have kind of fallen out of favor. Okay, so now we're going to talk about volume. Uh, we're going to talk about volume a lot more too when we go into the section on technical stock analysis but I just want to get into some of the basics of this. So volume is how many shares of a particular stock were traded that day and stocks trading at high volume have high liquidity. These are stocks typically on the major stock exchanges on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ and stocks trading at low volume typically off a major exchange. This is the over-the-counter stocks. These stocks have poor liquidity um, and obviously as we said you want to find a stock with high liquidity. Um, those poor liquidity stocks, you may not be able to sell them when you're looking to. And, you know, they're very easy to manipulate. As far as using volume as an indicator goes, look for volume in excess of the normal trading range. I'm not really going to get into that now. We have a whole topic on volume in Module 7. So for now, just think of volume as a way to measure the liquidity of a stock. So this is what we're going to be learning later on, guys. If this is something that looks very intimidating to you, don't worry, we are going to go very slow. We're going to go over technical stock analysis. This is basically what I use in order to do my swing trading because my strategy is I do have some long-term investments, but I also do have some investments that I swing trade, and swing trading is largely based off of technical stock analysis. So as you can see, the two sections I have highlighted down there, those are the volume on this um, candlestick chart, and we're going to talk all about this later on, guys. As you can see in that first highlighted section there in the beginning of June, we see rising volume and as a result we see rising stock prices and then we see a high volume sell-off towards the end of June into July. Again, you see rising volume, so volume is always a good indicator of what the price is going to do. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about dividends. I'm sure you guys have heard about dividends, but I'm hoping to tell you guys everything you need to know about dividends and nothing more. Uh, there's a lot to know about them. I just want to give you guys everything you need to know as an investor. So dividends are regular cash payments made to the holder of the stock, and many large and mega cap stocks pay dividends to shareholders. Now, investors who look for dividend stocks are often called income investors, and this is an investing strategy we're going to talk about later on. Dividend stocks are typically larger and well-established companies, and as a result, they are lower risk. As a lower risk investment, because your risk corresponds with your reward potential, they offer a lower return as far as stock price appreciation goes. But dividends can make up for that lower return. And my favorite part about dividends is that income investors can be paid in two ways. Number one, appreciation of the stock price. And number two is those regular cash dividend payments. And as a result, dividends can hedge against a loss. And I think I have an example of that next. If not, I'll just explain what I mean by that. What I mean by hedge against a loss is let's say you invest in a stock that pays a 4% dividend over the year, and that stock has a 3% loss. So over that one year, you're down 3% on that investment, but you actually made 4% in dividend payments. You're actually up 1% on that investment. So that is one way that dividend stocks can hedge against a loss. Now, dividend stocks are great for long-term investors, and dividend stocks are typically purchased for an income, not growth. If you're looking for growth, you look for growth stocks. So if you're an income investor, you're looking for dividend stocks. Stocks purchased for growth are known as growth stocks, and they typically do not pay dividends because they are growing companies that are reinvesting profits into future expansion. Dividends are not guaranteed, and a company could raise, lower, or eliminate a dividend at any time. However, this is generally a worst-case scenario. You typically do not see companies eliminating dividends unless there's something crazy going on. I know during 2008, um, Pfizer ended up eliminating their dividend for a short period of time. But other than that, you typically do not see companies changing their dividend unless they're rising it because they want to have a long track record of consistent dividends and rising dividends. So most companies that issue dividends continue to do so as well as increase them over time. This is what we want to see. And uh, dividends are also a great way to outpace inflation as well. So a lot of people like investing in dividend stocks as a result. So a dividend is measured in terms of dividend yield. So when you're looking at a dividend stock, um, you're going to see dividend yield. Dividend yield is what percentage of the share price is paid out in dividends annually. Now a dividend is typically paid quarterly. Uh, so they measure it annually, but you're actually paid four times a year. So let's look at an example of this. If you have a stock that is $100 a share and they pay $5 in dividends, that is a 5% dividend yield but they wouldn't pay you $5 once a year, they pay you $1.25 four times a year or once per quarter. Okay, so now it's time to look at something exciting. Here is our first example of a stock investment. So we're looking at one of my favorite dividend stocks here, Brookfield Renewables, BEP. So this is a dividend stock example for 2016. So let's say you're somebody who invested in Brookfield Renewables back on January 4th of 2016, and you sold one year later on January 3rd of 2017. So the stock price was $25.45 a share back in 2016, and by 2017 it was $29 a share. So your appreciation for that one year in terms of stock price is 13.9%, which is a fantastic return. But on top of this, you have to remember that Brookfield Renewables pays a great dividend. So in 2016, your dividend per share was $1.78, or 44.5 cents per quarter. So you got paid that amount four times per year. So the dividend yield on top of that was 6.1%. So your overall return is more like 20% on that investment, which is fantastic. So let's say you had 1,000 shares of Brookfield Renewables you would have seen a $3,550 stock appreciation as well as $1,780 paid to you in dividends. So your total return on that was $5,330. Uh, so that would be a pretty awesome investment if you were someone who looked at Brookfield Renewables. But I just wanted to give you guys an example of how dividend stocks can pay you in two different ways. So that's why a lot of people, especially beginners, love dividend stocks. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the risk and reward potential here. So every investor has a different level of risk tolerance, and age plays a factor in this. So a young person could have a very aggressive risk tolerance as they are decades from retirement, while a person five years from retirement would have a very low risk tolerance. 
as they will be drawing from their investments in the near future. So it does have to do with your personal tolerance for risk, and it also has to do with how close you are to retirement. Now, higher risk investments do yield a higher return, but I don't want you guys to confuse investing with your desire to gamble. Um, this is one of the psychological things we're going to talk about in the psychology of the stock market later on, but we're all hardwired with this desire to gamble, and I don't want you guys to have this desire to gamble with the stock market. Remember that a 50% loss does not require a 50% gain, it requires a 100% gain. So if you go out there and you gamble with your money and you lose 50%, if you got a 50% return, you'd be three quarters of the way back to where you were originally, so you actually need a 100% return to offset a 50% loss, just to you know throw that guy, throw that at you guys. A lot of people don't realize that. So let's take a look at a high risk investment that went well, and this is advanced micro devices. And uh, actually, that stock is over $13 a share today. This is back from um, August 10th. But if we look at what the stock price has done over the last year, they have seen an 84.2% return. So if you're someone who bought AMD a year ago, you are up over 100% at one point here. Um, that is a very awesome return, but it's not typical because this is a higher risk investment. So as you can see, when you invest in a higher risk stock, it's going to be more volatile, but there is a higher reward potential. Let me give you an example of a high risk investment that went against investors. Here we have Snapchat stock. This is the stock that went public and um, they really have not been doing too well. This is when, I believe this is the day they reported earnings and as you can see there, they were down 16.12% after hours. But without even factoring in that percentage, from the uh, peak there, they went to a 43.8% loss. So this is an example of a high risk investment that went against investors being down almost 50% after you figure in or actually over 50% after the hours trading there. So high risk investments can be good. They can also be very bad. So a lot of people would look at an example like AMD and say, oh, that's something I want. Well, would you also want the risk of losing 50% of your money like the people did here with Snapchat? Because if you're not comfortable with that kind of loss, you probably shouldn't make high risk investments because it can go either way. Okay, so now we're on to the quarterly earnings report. And uh, we're going to get into more of this stuff in module eight when we talk about fundamental stock analysis. But I just want to touch on this for now. So public companies file a quarterly earnings report. And um, like I said, we'll discuss this more later on in module eight when we talk about fundamental stock analysis. But quarterly earnings are used by investors to determine the financial health of a company. Now, long-term investors spend a lot of time reading earnings reports and um, analysts basically make estimated guesses on the quarterly results of a company. And then um, analysts also use earnings as a way to make buy, hold, and sell recommendations. So during an earnings report, this can be a very volatile time for a stock. If you see a company that beats earnings, you'll see it go up a lot. I think I talk about that here actually, yep. So the days before and after a report can be very volatile times for a stock. Strong earnings can send a stock soaring while inline or weak earnings that either meet expectations or fall below expectations can send a stock into a nosedive. Uh, the earnings report includes the sales, the expenses, and the net income for the previous quarter. Now also understand that most reports include the results from the previous quarter and the same quarter last year for comparison's sake so you can see how they're progressing and how they compare to what they did the previous quarter and one year ago. So here is an example of a stock that fell big after they reported inline earnings. So this is AMD. They went from 1362 down to 1004 a share. So the price of AMD stock fell 26.3% after they reported inline earnings that met uh, analyst expectations. So even though it was in line with expectations, it wasn't enough for investors. And this stock fell over 25%. Here's an example of a stock that did well after earnings. This is Netflix stock. Uh, they recently reported strong earnings and they went from 161.70 to 189.08 or they were up just under 17% after strong earnings. All right, so now we're going to get into supply and demand. And uh, this is one of the most important lessons you guys are gonna learn in this course, in my opinion. Um, the price of anything is determined by the market supply and the market demand. And like we said before, fear and greed are the precursors to supply and demand. Supply is the amount of a commodity, uh, product, or service, and demand is the desire of the buyers for it. High demand and an oversupply or greed drive up the price, and low demand and an oversupply or fear are going to lower the price. So fear and greed are the precursors to supply and demand, 
And uh, there is a, there's supply and demand with everything. There's supply and demand with the bread at the grocery store. There's supply and demand with a stock. This applies to anything, commodities. Everything out there has a market supply and a market demand. And this is basically how the prices uh, change on the stock market is due to supply and demand. Okay, so let's go over an example of demand, uh, just to paint a picture for you guys. It is the middle of winter and the power has gone out. You call up the power utility and they say the estimated restoration time is over 24 hours out. Every hardware store in a 50 mile radius has sold out of generators. However, one local store has two left and they have received 15 calls about them in the last two hours. So two generators left and there's a demand of at least 15. Uh, so 15 people want those two generators. Due to the shortage of supply and the high demand for the generators, the store decides to sell them at full price despite the sale they had going on. So initially they were selling that generator for 20% off, but all of a sudden they have so many people willing to buy it, they decide to sell it at full price. You're walking out the door with the last generator and somebody runs up to you with $100 above what you paid for it. So as you can see, there is a low supply for those generators and a high demand due to the circumstances. And as a result, people are paying well above the regular price for that generator. And uh, the one person there is trying to buy it for even more than the guy paid for it in the store in the parking lot because there's such a high demand for it. This is what happens with the stock as well. Now here's a perfect example of supply and boy do I feel bad for these mall kiosk owners because they're all having a hard time right now. The owner of a mall kiosk catches wind of the fidget spinner trend. Uh, the owner buys 1,000 spinners from China. However, every store in a 50 mile radius decides to jump on the trend as well. Suddenly customers are seeing fidget spinners for sale at every store they go to, whether it's the gas station or a clothing store. They're seeing them all over and as soon as the hype dies off, the supply surges so everyone has these fidget spinners. The owner of the mall kiosk sells the spinners at cost in order to recoup some of his money and overwhelming supply saturated the market. This is exactly what happened with these fidget spinners. As soon as everyone bought them and got them for sale, Nobody was interested anymore. The hype kind of died off and as a result there was an overwhelming supply of fidget spinners on the market and that drove the prices down for these fidget spinners. So that's an example of supply. So let's talk about the supply of a stock. So the supply of the stock is the total number of shareholders who would be willing to sell at a given price. So here are 10 shareholders right here. Let's say they all have an equal number of shares and each of them has a set price that they would be willing to sell at. So each shareholder values their price of ownership at a different price and as the stock price goes up, the supply goes up as the investors sell. So obviously at $9 per share, three investors would sell. Investor number one, two, and three would sell, but four through 10, they're looking for a uh, much higher price there. They're looking to get more money than um, what those three were looking for. Now let's look at $15 a share. Let's say the share price rises to 15, at this point seven would sell. So the only ones who wouldn't sell would be investor 8, 9, and 10. So as share prices rise, you're going to see investors selling, and as a result, you're going to see a rising supply. And um, if demand doesn't keep up with that supply, then prices are going to start to level off. So now let's look at the demand of a stock. This is the total number of buyers who would be willing to buy at a given price. So again, here are 10 buyers. Let's say they're all looking to buy the same number of shares, and each potential buyer has a set price in mind. As the stock price goes down, demand increases as the set price is met. So basically at $18 a share, only two people would buy, number one and number two. Three through 10, they're looking to buy at a lower price. But at $6 a share, nine of these 10 investors would buy. So as the share price falls, demand increases because there are more potential buyers who are having their set prices met. So this is basically how supply and demand works in the stock market. And um, if you're seeing demand increase and the supply can't keep up, then you're going to see that stock price increase. So now we're going to talk about the tipping point of supply and demand. So at a certain point, the decline in a stock price levels off as the demand increases. A stock price that is soaring eventually levels off when the increased supply exceeds the demand from other buyers. These are the basic rules of supply and demand here. This results in a period of equilibrium or a trend shift. These tipping points are known as support and resistance areas for a stock. This is all technical stock analysis, guys. This might be a little more than you know right now, but we're going to cover that in Module 7. Nothing to worry about now. We're going to really go in-depth about this stuff. But um, just understand that supply and demand are basically the reason that a stock price changes or the price of anything changes. It has to do with the, the supply and the demand uh, the, of the market. 
So here's just an example looking at AMD. So obviously as the stock reached just about $15 a share, many investors began to sell because their price threshold was met so they sold off. Then the price went into a decline as investors were selling and supply exceeded the demand. However, as that price gets lower and lower, more potential buyers have the price fall within their um, buy target. And as a result, they start scooping up shares and eventually the demand exceeds the supply. And then you see that trend reverse and it starts going back up until eventually we hit a point where supply will exceed the demand and it'll go back down. This is uh, why prices change on a stock. All right, so now we're going to talk about inflation. So inflation is the invisible force that eats away at your wealth. And essentially, inflation is less purchasing power of the dollar over time. So the number one goal of an investor, your first goal anyway, I, I mean, you should have a goals above and beyond this, but your number one goal is to outpace inflation through appreciation. So you're buying something that will appreciate in value, and your first goal as an investor is to outpace inflation to protect the buying power of your money. If there was no such thing as inflation and $1 today was worth $1 in 10 years, most people would just put their money in the bank and save it in the bank. But because of inflation, people do invest with their money, which is actually a good thing. That's one of the reasons why inflation is actually not such a bad thing, is it forces us to invest and do something with our money. Now, saving money in a bank account is not a good way to outpace inflation. It's actually one of the worst ways out there, other than just holding cash in your mattress. So let's go ahead and talk about that bank account. So most people save money in a bank account. And having an emergency fund is very important. And we will discuss this in Module 3. That's all about the things you need to do before you start investing. Since 2000, the average rate of inflation has been 2.2% per year. The average interest rate on a bank account is 0.05% interest. So obviously that interest rate is nowhere near the average rate of inflation since 2000. So each year, the average saver who saves money in a bank account loses 2.15% of the buying power of their money due to the invisible force known as inflation. That's why you guys need to understand inflation and understand that any money sitting in your bank account is being deteriorated and it's being eaten away by inflation. So here's an example of inflation here. Um, let's say you had $100,000 in 2017 based on the rate of inflation of 2.2%. That would have the equivalent buying power of $109,094 in 2022. Now let's say you saved $100,000 in a bank account earning 0.05% interest. After those same five years, you would have $100,250. So over five years, $8,844 was lost due to inflation. Now you may be wondering why I have a picture of termites and an old man here. That is because you need to think about inflation as you do aging or termites. Um, day by day, you're not going to see much of a difference. If you look at yourself in the mirror today and then in a week, you're going to look the same. But if you look at a picture of yourself from five years ago, you're going to go, wow, I really have aged. That's inflation. It's invisible day to day, but when you look at it um, over many years, it's very apparent. It's also like termites. It's an invisible force eating away at the structural integrity of your house, and eventually that house is going to come crumbling down. So that's what I want you guys to think about when it comes to inflation.